My name is Annabeth Shirley, and I'm a cellist based here in Oregon. I grew up in Salem, went to South Salem High School, and then pursued cello further at the University of Michigan, and then all the way to The Hague in the Netherlands. Uh, I moved back to Portland recently and have since started playing with um, Portland Baroque Orchestra, Seattle Baroque Orchestra, to just a, a number of different Baroque groups um, in the Pacific Northwest. And St. Paul's has always been a home to me. I love coming and playing music here with Paul and, and all of the other wonderful musicians. So I wanted to just tell you a little bit about the cello and specifically about the Bach Suites today. So what I have here with me right now is this is a modern cello, what you might all recognize. It has four strings tuned in fifths. <laughs> It is supported by this end pin, which rests on the ground, and is tuned either with the fine, fine tuners down here on the fingerboard, or the pegs at the top of the peg box. So the, the Bach cello suites, which many of you probably recognize, the first one starts this way. <laughs> famous now. I've even heard it used as a ringtone. Um, these suites were not actually published until a century after that they were written, and even then were not discovered until almost a century later by Pablo Casals. He discovered this first edition in a sheet music shop, and before the suites had sort of been known as just mere etudes or studies. But Pablo Casals took the suites and really understood them and performed them and eventually recorded them. And he performed them all over the world and people soon recognized the, the great um, musical genius of these suites. So it's really thanks to Pablo Casals that we have to, uh, um, that we now all know about these suites and perform them regularly. So each suite is made up of a prelude and five dance movements, which is a form common to the Baroque era. The, each suite is in a different key, so we start in G major, we have D minor, E flat major, and each of these keys represents a different affect or mood, and really showcases what the cello can do in terms of its range and musicality, and also showcases Bach's genius in how he can express such deep human emotion through each of these individual suites. It's really quite amazing what, you know, a simple box with four strings and a bow can do to express these depths of human emotion. Now, when Bach was composing, the instrument that he knew as a cello does not look much like this that we have today. The shape is pretty similar but the size varied greatly. It often had five or six strings. It could have been tuned in fourths, fifths, um, or a variety thereof. The bow looked different, um, and the bow was often either played overhand, as, as we're used to, or underhand, as a viola da gamba would play. And it could have been played in any number of positions, resting on the floor, standing up with the cello on a long end pin. Um, some of the smaller cellos are even played under the shoulder like a violin. So it's actually a bit unclear for what instrument Bach was composing these suites. The first four suites fit relatively comfortably on our modern conception of this modern cello. Four strings tuned in fifths. But suites five and six vary a little bit. Suite five in C minor actually requests and requires that the cello be, be the top string be tuned down to a G. So I have my Baroque cello here all set up. Let me let me show that to you. So instead of all fifths, the top string is tuned to down one step. So we have a fourth. Normally we would have an A for the top string. Specifically requests that we have tuned the top string down to a G, which makes the instrument very, very resonant because we have these two Gs that resonate with each other, which is the fifth. 
fifth to the C. And then D is the fifth to the G. For the sixth suite, Bach requested that the suite be performed on a five-string cello. Now, there are all sorts of interpretations of what that cello is today. We call it today a violoncello piccolo because it's to fit all five strings on the other cello is the body is a bit smaller. Um, some scholars say that this cello was actually meant to be played to spala or on the shoulder. So there are some performances of people playing the sixth suite on this little mini cello on the shoulder like a violin. The cello also had many, many different names at this time. So that's also why it's unclear um, what, what instrument Bach was composing for. It was called violoncello because it was a little violone, but it also was known as a violoncino or violoncello da spalla. I mean, there are all sorts of different names and depending on the region or the even just different families, how they, how they called their instruments. So that's another reason why it's confusing, why we aren't quite sure um, what instrument these were composed for. However, today it's pretty standard practice that we perform them either on this modern cello or on this Baroque setup style. And I'll talk a little bit about the Baroque setup right now. So as you can see, perhaps the biggest difference is that this um, Baroque cello does not have an end point. So I, how I, I hold it is I just rest it between my legs and it sits there pretty comfortably, basically nestled in my calves. I don't have to squeeze, it just kind of rests there. The other big difference is that the strings are made out of gut, actual cat gut we call it, but it's sheep or ram gut. Um, the first two, A and D strings, the top two strings are pure gut, and the bottom two strings are covered, wound with silver, and this helps to get them to speak more clearly, because a, a very, very thick gut, pure gut string would not speak very well. This, the gut strings give the, give the sound a very, very earthy, um, I think warmer sound than the steel strings do. And it's, it does take a while to get used to them. They are more finicky because they are made of a live animal. <laughs> but um, I think overall it's worth it to experiment and to try playing with the gut strings. The other big difference is in the bow. So you can see here the shape of the Baroque bow and the modern bow is quite different. The Baroque bow comes to a point at the tip whereas the modern bow maintains more of the relatively um, parallel nature from the tip to the frog. And this is just, um, this developed in terms of, you know, technology that we had. So before we did not have the, these screw mechanisms, no metal, it was all just pure wood as this bow is, wood and horsehair, which, and the shape of the bow means that it lends itself to a very um, speaking quality. So it, as you play the length of the bow, it naturally tends to fade, and the sound is very much like you're let, letting out an out-breath. And that is one of the key characteristics of Bach's music, is the this, this speaking nature and speaking quality of, of his writing style. The bow is also, it's more agile because it's a little bit shorter. So you, you're more free to do lots of little nuanced um, bowings. So now I'll just play a little example so you can hear the difference between these two instruments. <laughs> It was 
my pleasure to share a little bit of the cello with you today. I look forward to sharing more with you in the future and to sharing more music at St. Paul's. Thank you for watching.